So I, I want to make just a, a few comments, and I want to first talk about uh, the importance of public education uh, for me personally, and then secondly, just talk to you a little bit about uh, two issues that we are facing in the legislature uh, with regard to public education. One is the class size uh, mandate, which uh, Policy Watch has really done an amazing job in covering, and the advocates here have done a tremendous job in advocating for. And then I thought I might also just talk about principal uh, pay, too, because in many ways both of those pieces of the legislation, to me, encompass what I would call unintended consequences. We could be, we could say it's intended consequences. I think that is something uh, that we could have a larger discussion about. So as Rob mentioned, I mean, I, I have spent my entire career in public service working for the state of North Carolina, having been able to work at the highest levels of all three branches of government and in, in state government. And part of the reason I decided to pursue a career in public service was uh, it was a way for me to give back to the state. Uh, as many of you know, uh, my parents were immigrants to this country. They came here more than uh, 50 years ago. They, I often say that the best decision my parents ever made was to move from the cold winters of Dorchester, Massachusetts to Fayetteville, North Carolina, <laughs> uh, where, where, I, where I grew up. And when my parents moved to Fayetteville, I, um, I was a product of Cumberland County Public Schools from K-12. Uh, I will tell you that Bill Harrison, who used to be the chair of the, uh, the state school board, is actually my high school principal when I uh, grew up. And so I, I still call him Principal Harrison, just talked to him last week. And so uh, I, I share that with you because um, education, as we all know, is a great equalizer in, in, our, in our state and in our society. And in many ways, that is what I, I am a product of that. I mean, as someone who was a child of immigrants who went to an integrated high school, who experienced the love of, of, of teachers that I had that really uh, often tell the story. I had an associated, uh, an AP chemistry professor who I still remember to this day would teach his class on the, on the Texas Instrument 99 computer. <laughs> and, and I remember that he would drive to Greenville uh, to East Carolina uh, once or twice a week uh, to get his master's degree in chemistry. And, you know, today, uh, back then, you would actually get a pay raise if you actually pursued higher <laughs> education, and this General Assembly does it. And I just, I, I vividly remember him um, having to leave class early to get his master's degree. And, and, and he was a kind of, he was a kind of teacher uh, that for no pay would come to my home, uh, to my parents' home, and tutor me to make sure that I could master the materials um, and it's that kind of, it's kind of that devotion uh, to the teaching profession that I, that I feel is what made the state so great and really what public education is really all about. And today as a father of uh, two young children that go to public elementary school here in Wake County, the Wiley Elementary School, uh, we, we see the direct result of what public education can do now um, for our own children. You know, Terry, Terry Sanford, Governor Terry Sanford had this great quote um, when he was governor that said a second-rate education means only a second-rate future uh, for our state. And I, and I, and I think that that's, an, that's a quote that is applicable today as it was uh, more, than, more than 50 years ago. So where, where are we today with, uh, with public education? So I, I, don't need to tell, uh, I don't need to tell this crowd because it's really well encompassed in the, the report that Chris has put out with the unraveling that we have seen our public education policies and funding go backwards over uh, the last seven years, whether it's um, the fact that we, uh, we are now 40th, ranked 40th by Education Week on a various numbers of metrics uh, for public education, whether it's the fact that our teacher pay uh, remains among the lowest in the country, or whether it's about the fact that our per pupil spending um, is among the lowest two in our state, and we are clearly seeing regression in public education. And the two specific issues that I'd like to just briefly talk to you about, I mean, the first is around the class, the K-3 through class size mandate. Now, I, I mean, I, I, I would go so far as to say that I think there seems to be consensus by both Democrats and Republicans, although, of course, maybe you can explain how they've arrived at those numbers, the specific numbers for uh, the class size mandate, which to me are a bit bizarre. 
but uh, gen the general lower teacher to student ratio I think folks generally believe is a good thing for the instruction of our children but that being said if you don't put any money behind it because you you need additional money to fund teachers you need additional money to fund classrooms uh, the physical classrooms it's very hard to really meet that mandate and that's exactly what has happened when the general assembly in 2016 um, put this in place to reduce classroom size that really has created class size chaos and i will tell you uh, I, I toured Briarcliff Elementary School because the PTA there got organized and they invited uh, legislators to come visit there. I saw combined classrooms in fourth and fifth grade uh, that has resulted in cutting instructional uh, classroom time for kids because if you think about the fact that when you um, have large classrooms like that, you actually have to determine, I mean, classroom management becomes much more cumbersome and actually cuts into classroom time. I was at Briar Creek Elementary School where I saw that they had moved the music class into the cafeteria. Um, I, have, I have seen it with, uh, I, I did a panel discussion yesterday, uh, on Sunday with the principal at Fuller Elementary School where I heard about additional combined classroom sizes that, was, that were impacting them. I will tell you one thing that we've talked about, Chris talks about this in his report, is classroom size really kind of pushes up the teacher to student ratio from fourth to twelfth grade. But what is interesting to me is now we're actually getting reports about the fact that they're looking at pre-K classrooms too, which means it's actually impacting early childhood education in some systems where they're looking for classroom sizes too. So that, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a challenge um, for us as well. So, you know, I, I, it, when, you, when Chris speaks, I'm sure he will tell you that the red flags for this were actually came up even before 2016. But from my perspective as a new member of the legislature, as a new member of the legislature in 2016 when this bill, uh, 2017, excuse me, 2017, this House Bill 13, as you may remember, was a bill that was passed in the House that actually provided classroom flexibility to address this issue. And this was, this was a solution that was championed by stakeholders and championed both by House Republicans and House <coughs> Democrats. As I, as I like to point out, in February of 2017 when that bill, uh, the same bill that I have now introduced, uh, I've just introduced in the General Assembly, when that bill was brought before the House floor, that bill passed 114 to zero. That means every House Democrat and every House Republican voted for the class wise flexibility. But of course when the bill came over to the Senate, for reasons that are still unexplained to me, uh, they did not. They did not take this up. Now, it, during the during April of that of last year, I had offered an amendment to actually say that that there would be intent language to the General Assembly to fund um, the fact that we uh, were we, we knew that this was going to impact the specialists, the arts education, the arts, physical education, and music uh, teachers. And they, in classic Senate fashion, offered an amendment behind mine to table it. Uh, what is interesting is they had included that intent language later in the budget when it came out, which to me is an admission to the fact that they knew uh, that they had not attached the money to the class size mandate. So when we fast forward to October of last year, as you may recall, we were called in for uh, a special session, the priorities of which always remain a mystery uh, to all of us. Uh, but when we had that special session, uh, the House Technical Corrections Bill to the budget, again, had the same identical language of House Bill 13 that would offer that classroom size flexibility. Um, and then somehow, even though that bill uh, was publicly available, the Senate decided that they would uh, then just hold a joint Senate and House uh, Budget Committee in which they offered, um, they offered the technical corrections version to the budget in which that language mysteriously disappeared. And so this was done for procedural purposes because as I learned, because I knew, you cannot offer an amendment to a conference report that is before the joint committee. And actually this, this is exactly one of the points that Chris makes in the unraveling is you see, uh, you see the short changing of an open and deliberative process that prevents exactly this kind of debate or opportunities to change legislation because so much of what is determined is determined in the back rooms before they even have committee meetings. And so I think if you were to talk to Representative Cynthia Ball, who was here too, uh, most of us as legislators face the constant um, challenge of getting a bill at 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening only to have to turn around and vote on it 
uh, the next morning with less than 24 hours uh, notice. So that, that was in October, and so you know, we missed the perfect opportunity to solve the classroom size problem in October of last year, so now we forward to January. Uh, again, we don't really know why we're back in special session. There's you know, been some efforts to focus on restructuring the judiciary, but I, uh, I had introduced, I introduced a bill uh, that was House Bill 13, um, and it, it, met, it met the requirements under the adjournment resolution and the Senate, <coughs> Senate rules that would, again, provide this short-term solution. As, as I have pointed out, this is, to me, it's not a Democrat or a Republican issue because, as I mentioned, the House Republicans passed this, uh, House and Democrats passed this bill 114 to 0. It's a chamber issue between uh, the Senate in the House, and so till this date, uh, we have seen nothing. Now, I think the latest that we've heard, we've heard based on reports from WREL, is that they are feverishly working on this. But I can tell you, um, and frankly, I think a lot of folks here in the audience can tell you, those that have parents or those that advocate for schools, can tell you that this has created an extraordinary amount of stress already, and they are already making changes to the school to adjust to the class size requirement. And so while we may think of May as being the deadline for trying to get this done when school boards have to pass their budget, we already know this is creating class size chaos. And I can tell you from my personal perspective, uh, nothing is more heartbreaking than to, to me than to have my son's elementary art teacher come to me in tears, come to me in tears to, because she is in fear of the fact that she may not be able to come back to teach in that school next year. And we should never, ever treat our teachers with that kind of disrespect. Um, and, and really, the stories are countless. I mean, I, I've received teachers from, I've, I've received emails from teachers that have, that have conveyed to me that they cannot go to sleep because of the stress. I had, I had a, an email that I actually included in a letter that I sent to all other 49 members of the Senate in which I had uh, requested them to take up this legislation. I shared with them the story of a, of a family, of, of a, a couple uh, that decided to move into the neighborhood so they could be close uh, to their school. Um, it was a single income uh, family in which the father has to work in Durham, but, they, but the mother wanted to be walking distance to be able to take the kindergartner to school and then they were informed that they would not be able to go to that school anymore. And so, you know, when, when families are making decisions on buying homes <coughs> that can be close in close proximity to their school, and that is disrupted because of the fact that uh, this General Assembly has decided to play politics with our kids' lives. I mean, that, that, is, that is wrong. Um, the second issue that I will share with you, uh, and this is an issue that really came up um, based on my, my discussions most recently with a, with a group of uh, parents and principals is really around, around principal pay. Uh, and you know, we could certainly talk about teacher pay too because that, that has been abominable as well. But on the, on the principal pay side, as you know, uh, this General Assembly has also um, passed a new uh, pay for performance model is what they call it, which really moves from discounting experience and education into a model that is based on performance. Now this should sound familiar to every, each and every one of you because this is exactly what they've done with the teaching profession uh, as well. And as a result of this new model, again, whether it's unintended consequences or not, you now have a salary scale that, that while it does go from a minimum of 55,000 to 61,000 for a principal, it actually reduces their principal pay from 111,000 to 81,000. And so you've got principals now uh, in the system that have been in there for 20, 25 to 30 years that are looking at a 30% cut in their principal pay, uh, of which uh, many of them really have no interest in staying in the profession if that's, if that's what's going to happen. Now, we, the General Assembly passed what they call a home hold harmless provision that would essentially say that mm -hmm. that cut will not uh, take place, but just, just as I've talked about the teachers with, the, with kind of the stress that they've created, uh, with, with those teachers, I mean, it's creating the same kind of stress with principals. I had a principal tell me that they've got two daughters in college, and the idea that you can cut their pay by 30%, I mean, they, they don't even know if they're going to be able to pay for their college tuition. So, you know, this, this stuff, you know, this stuff is, is um, I mean, there really aren't any words to describe it. Um, 
you know, Susan Evans is here just to be on the school board. I mean, it really, um, I think the pressure that it puts on our commissioners, on our school boards, on parents, on teachers, uh, we, we, we are just, we're not taking a position uh, from the state to support uh, public education the way uh, that we should or we, we used to. And then when you, uh, when you overlay, you know, these two issues with so many other issues that we've dealt with, whether it's the expansion of the voucher program or charter schools with no accountability or the achievement school districts, for example, I mean, we, we are seeing, we are seeing a public school, we're seeing a public education system, which in, you know, the name of innovation or in the name of performance, I don't think anybody here would argue with the need for uh, our students needing to do better. We all want that, but in many ways, this has all been used as a way, I think, to uh, completely undermine uh, public education. So, you know, that's, that's obviously the bad news. I mean, I think, I think the good news from my perspective is when I talk to uh, parents in Wake County, uh, there are an amazing number of parents who I, I don't think quite understood the impact that the General Assembly can have on public education and their ability to mobilize has been really amazing. And so I think it's been an eye-opening process for uh, many parents um, and it's really not just a Wake County issue, although my Republican colleagues would probably portray it as such. It's, not, it's an issue that's <coughs> impacting uh, teachers and principals and parents across the school system. Uh, in, in North Carolina, and I think that the fact that it's, it, it, so while it may be the unraveling, um, I would say there's going to be a reckoning and awakening uh, that's going to that's gonna come soon. So um, I am happy to take questions. I'll turn it over to Chris, but uh, again, Rob, thank you to Policy Watch for letting me here.